Hey everyone, welcome to the Foundry Church. We are so excited that you joined us here today. My name is Jeff Vandermolen and I am the ministry director here at the Foundry. In this second week of Advent, we get to celebrate the peace that Jesus Christ gives us. Even though our world is in chaos and turmoil, especially in the year 2020, we can rest in the peace that Jesus gives us. Isaiah 9 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this Christmas season, we encourage you to rest in the peace that Jesus gives us. Here at The Foundry, we are passionate about being in the Word of God. This Advent season, our amazing team of writers put together an Advent calendar for you and your families. These calendars are put together to encourage you to spend time in God's Word and to learn from Him. If you are here worshiping with us today in person, you can pick up an Advent calendar as you exit the building. Or if you're worshiping online, you can find these calendars at foundrychurch.net. Scroll down and they're easily accessible on that page. Again, we encourage you to be in the Word of God because we believe that the Word of God transforms us from the inside out. We're incredibly grateful for those of you who have been faithful in giving of your tithes and offerings. Thank you. If you would like to give to the Foundry Church, there are three different ways you can do so. First, if you would like, you can send your tithe and offering to the Foundry Church by mailing it to our address. If you would like to save on postage, you can drop your tither offering in the black boxes as you leave the worship service, service today. Or if you're worshiping with us online or would like to give online, you can do so by going to foundrychurch.net slash donate and follow the super easy instructions we have for you there. This Advent season, we have the opportunity to support 24 different families in our community. As you exit the worship service today, you will find a Christmas tree located in the main causeway. On this Christmas tree, there are tags with a list of gifts that are needed for these 24 families. We encourage you to take a tag and purchase some items for these families. If you choose to do so, we ask that the gifts be brought back to the Foundry Church by December 15, unwrapped and with the tags that you took home with you today. If you are worshiping with us online, you can find these gifts under the Serve tab on our homepage. Again, this is an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus this Christmas season. That's all I've got for you today. It's been a pleasure sharing the announcements with you and welcoming you to the Foundry Church. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at foundrychurch.net or if you're worshiping with us in person, you can stop at the info desk in the causeway after the worship service. If you would like to stay up to date on what's happening at the Foundry Church, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, we're so glad you're here. I'm going to turn it over now to Justin as he leads us in worship. When John chapter 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is where our hope is found today, church. If we need healing, when we need shelter, Jesus is the solution. We're agreeing today in faith that hope has a name, and it is Emmanuel, because God is always with us. Let's sing together. Through the silence with glory in the highest, the hope of all creation resting in his mother's arms. With 
all on the horizon Ringing through the heavens The long-awaited Savior Come to set the captives free Come to set the captives free Come set us free Come on church
God, we praise you today for the gift of your son, the gift of your kindness by coming down to save us all. We worship you here, knowing you are our only hope and that you are the one true healer. And I pray for those of us in person right now or maybe watching online that don't know you, Lord, but are eager to find you. Come near to them, come near to the brokenhearted like you promised and reveal more of yourself today. We pray uh, you just give Eric the words to say as we listen for your voice. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things, God. Amen. showman now is it showman or showman 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 yeah great showman I'm gonna go with that all right have you ever seen that I don't know if you have but I've watched it and um, I'm not gonna lie I'm kind of a fan now anytime there's Hugh Jackman I will not hide my ardent man crush of how great he is he was Jean Valjean in Les Mis he's the greatest showman he's also Wolverine and let's be honest, the dude's kind of jacked. He's just awesome. Oh, he's Hugh Jackman. I mean, what else do you expect? He's just awesome. I like Hugh Jackman. But in this movie, he has this character, and I love it because um, he fixates on something. He, as a young boy, was very poor, and he liked this girl who was from a very wealthy family. And he was going to do everything he could to give her the life he thought she deserved because she left all the wealth and everything to come live in kind of a tenant apartment in, uh, in, in old time New York, right? And it's just this great story. And he has this uh, song, it's everything you ever want, you know? And it's like, and you get going, it's like everything you ever need. And you're like, oh, and it's here right in front of you. And then the bearded lady is like, this is what you want to be. And you're like, oh, I'm in. Because it's so good. It tells you like, it's everything you've ever wanted. It's all these things and it's wrapped up into it. And the theme of the movie really goes throughout this, it's everything you ever want, into kind of the capstone song of it, which is really, uh, it's, it's titled Never Enough. It's Never Enough. And I think it's really interesting. It was sung by kind of a, uh, well, never mind, terrible character in the movie, but um, uh, another person. And, and the, the call of that song was, it's never enough. All the good, all the, all the best in life is never enough without the one thing I want. And whatever that one thing may be, it's the thing you fixate on. And it's this theme where um, when you fixate on something, when you get your focus so securely on something, you actually can lose sight of, you'll lose your peripheral vision and you can't see what's going on around you. And what I would like to do is introduce you to someone who should have been fixated. Her name is Elizabeth. She is the wife of the priest, Zachariah. Zachariah was of the, tri of the um, order of Abijah. It's an, it's an ancient order back to King David. And um, she, her bloodline traces back to Aaron, the very first high priest, right? So she is someone who is deeply steeped in the Jewish traditions of worship, and here's what we know about them. It says this in Luke chapter one, that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God, but they had no children. They had no children. So they were righteous in the sight of God. They fulfilled with joy their, their worship responsibilities in living faithfully under the law of God. And they were righteous in the sight of God, which means their hearts were blameless. They weren't shaking their fist, but they were people who had a heartache. They had never had children. And scripture points it out very clearly. The reason they hadn't had children is because Elizabeth could not conceive. Be hard not to fixate on that reality 
in the life you live when you are someone who is in a covenant theology where the promise is life and passing it on to the next generation. But when no generation comes from you, what do you do with that? How do you hold that tension? She didn't fixate on it, but she was very old by this time. Then one day, uh, Zechariah's priestly order, his division was uh, selected and he by lot was chosen to burn incense in the temple. So he went in to fulfill his priestly duties and upon doing that and being in the temple, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and it scared him. It, it kind of freaked him out because he's the only one in there. It says this, that he was in burning incense and the people were outside the temple praying for him. So he's doing this, they're praying for him and the Lord sends his angel Gabriel to speak to him. And he says, man, don't be afraid. I don't know if he said man, but he said, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. The Lord has heard your prayer. To which I think as a priest and a righteous person, he's like, which one? I, you know, but there would have always been one underlying theme in his life, the prayer for a child. The Lord has heard your prayer. And your wife, Elizabeth, is going to conceive and have a son, and you are to name him John. And then he just gave him some, some rules for the road for John's life. He's never to drink wine, you know, and, and just some different things. He also said he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will be filled with the Spirit before he's born. That's not happened before, right? So that's pretty interesting. And all these rules kind of come down. And then Zechariah does the amazing thing of doubting what Gabriel had told him. And he is struck mute. He cannot speak until the birth of the child. Eventually, this news is, um, is communicated by writing, and Elizabeth hears of it, and wonder of wonders that a few years later, or a few months later, this woman, who is well beyond the age of bearing children, has a little bump going, and she's pregnant. And the excitement of that, I mean, I can't even imagine the hope and the joy and the, and the feeling of, of being like, oh my goodness, it's finally happened. This thing that, um, that has broken my heart month after month for years, for decades, for a lifetime, that, that ache has been solved and there's so much hope in her life because their prayer was answered. And God was not only going to give them a child, he was going to give them a very special child, a child that would make ready the way for the Messiah. And um, in the meantime, there's a relative of Elizabeth who is living in Nazareth. Her name is Mary. Now, Elizabeth down in Judea and Mary up in Nazareth, about 80 miles, but quite a distance on foot, right? I mean, when's the last time you walked 80 miles? It's a long hike down to the Judean foothills where um, Elizabeth lived from Nazareth. But Mary, this cousin of Elizabeth, is um, visited by an angel. And the angel says to her, blessed are you among women, and tells her how she has been chosen to carry the Christ child, that the Holy Spirit will in, like invest Develop her and cover her. I mean, the temple theology is super thick there, right? This, this cloud of the Spirit envelops her and impregnates her, and she will carry the Christ child, the very Son of God, into this world. She will bear him into the world. And immediately upon hearing this, Mary gets up and she departs to go to the house of her Aunt Elizabeth and Uncle Zachariah because they're priests. And in my mind, I think this, who would you go to if that happened? Go to the people who know him best. And they were righteous and they loved God and they didn't have children, so they probably had time for her. And off she goes. She gets, you know, I don't know if on her donkey or on her feet, and takes off. And she gets down to well, I think, I think it was in Bethlehem. She gets to the place where Elizabeth is in the Judean countryside. And when she gets there, we find her being greeted, greeting Elizabeth and Elizabeth's greeting coming back at her. Check this out. I mean, pretty big story here, right? You've got a very old woman who is finally pregnant and it's a divine miracle. You've got a very young woman who's pregnant a little early and it's a divine miracle. And they're coming together at the doorpost of Zechariah and Elizabeth's house. Check this out. It's such a good story. Luke chapter 1, 35, 39 to 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. So it was a town in the hill country, unspecified. Um, 
where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. This is super good. Catch this. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in a loud voice, in a loud voice. Now, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I think I have kind of a loud voice sometimes. But I want you to have an expected, an, an understanding of what Mary expected. Like, Elizabeth, and coming back at her, like she, she greets her and, and is like, Elizabeth, and in a loud voice, okay, so it's probably a one or two room bedroom, I want you to imagine this greeting. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. And the shock and the wonder and the absolute glow of Elizabeth. You would have thought she'd have been like, oh, man. Nope. Blessed are you among women. It erupts out of her. It's loud. It's, it's forceful. And it's absolutely filled with joy. Blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby inside me began to leap. Which, side note, Mary had to be like, what? Baby inside of you? Like, that, that would have been a shock. As soon as I heard it, my, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she that believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. That is a phenomenal story. It is an amazing story because Elizabeth is the first person we know in Scripture to have a response to Christ. She responded to the presence of God in her home, and she responded loudly and vigorously and with great joy and satisfaction. But here's the thing, and I love this. Elizabeth had some really cool news to share, but what happened? That, it didn't, it didn't mitigate or diminish her news, but there was something bigger there. There was something more significant, and the presence of Christ made her pregnancy all the more important and relevant to the story. But the presence of Christ literally overshadowed what was going on in Elizabeth's life. And she wasn't like, I'm pregnant too. No, she explodes with this blessed are you and blessed is the child you will bear and this huge kind of blessing rolls out of her. Why? Because Jesus Christ was there and Elizabeth shows us the posture of someone who worshiped and had their focus on a God who blesses her and not the blessing he had given. Church, we need to get our heads around that. Her heart was on the God who had blessed her but it was there before he blessed her. So she wasn't fixated on the blessing. It wasn't the only thing. And that really comes out of our devotions this week, um, out of that Advent calendar. If you read that, that should be familiar. She fixated, she focused on God who blessed her, not the blessing he gave. Don't lose your, your sight on that. It's a really important element to this. Elizabeth was finally gonna be a mom. The empty arms were finally gonna be full and they were gonna be holding her own child, who again was very special. It was John the Baptist. It was a big deal. She was gonna be raising up a child who would make, what, make, way, make ready the way of the Lord. It's a really cool story and a very, very special child was coming into her life, but something bigger came in than her own news. I mean, she'd been visited by the same angel. Just get the dramatic kind of like shift in her focus. Here's a young girl, Mary, who's probably gonna be pregnant multiple times by the assumption of her culture as she grows up into womanhood. Here's Elizabeth, who had been barren all her life and never conceived and carried a child. Who would you be more fixated on? I think we'd all be like, that's really exciting for her. But she wasn't. Why? Why? Because she understood that God had a plan. And she got to be a part of it. But God was it. God was her focus. He was her passion. She, he was who she loved. She loved the Lord. And she served the Lord in spite of her heartache. So she loved the Lord and served the Lord in spite of her blessings. 
She didn't fixate on that. I love that reality. Can you imagine the moment where she had longed to have a child and that, that longing fulfilled and then the absolute sheer wonder of coming out of her own mouth, her speaking those words to Mary thinking, wow, like the wonder she felt. Why? Because she recognized the presence of the God she had served all her life. She didn't tell Mary, I'm pregnant. She blessed Mary. What a wonderful example of humility, of grace. Mary had gone to her aunt to find counsel and wisdom, and she had received it in abundance. Why? Why was she blessed by the counsel and wisdom of her aunt? Because her aunt wasn't fixated on what was going on in her life. She was attuned to what God was doing. The story was bigger than Elizabeth's experience, and I think that's important for us to hear. So let's shift the focus. Let's go away from Elizabeth and Mary and let's talk about you and I. Let's look at you and I. When God fulfills your hopes and dreams and my desire for you, it's funny because our hopes and dreams are like, I'd really like to eat inside of Chick-fil-A. Seems like Disney World right now, right? But um, you have other hopes and dreams. You have desires and wants deep within your heart. And when God fulfills those hopes and desires of healing, maybe for you it is a child. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe for you it's graduation. Maybe you would really like to meet your spouse and get married and have that life of intimacy and closeness with someone. When God fulfills your hopes and dreams, make sure you have the posture of Elizabeth. Make Make sure you have walked with the Lord so that when the blessing does come, you don't fixate so much that you lose God in the process. You worship the one who provided, not what he provided. Often people will long for a child in their life. And we see people go through seasons of hurt and want for a child. And, and the danger is that when the child comes, you can fixate and you can worry and you can obsess and you can lose your mind or lose your purpose really just focusing and only seeing that. And the God you begin to serve is parenting that child when that is a big part of your life, but it's not the only part. There's a God to serve and love and be in relationship for you personally. I think, um, you know, for some of us, we've gone through sicknesses or diagnoses and, diagnoses and, it's, and it's been devastating. And God healed you or brought you through a long healing or he healed you miraculously and you've survived and your life is a living testament to his power and his, and his purposes. But here's what can happen. We begin to fixate on the healing. So we start taking control of the things we can to guard our life. We start focusing and obsessing on diet and exercise and healthy routine. Those are good things. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we get fixated on our health and all that, like we get very internally focused, it's a deadly um, kind of com combination in us. We begin to serve the interest of our body instead of being a part of the body of Christ, the church, living and active in this world. So we think that we, we begin to worship the remedies for our health instead of the one who granted us health, the one who fills our lungs with air, the, the God who has knit us together, given us purpose, and saved us from our sin. We need to be careful of that. God may provide for you financially, and, and in doing so, you may start to hoard for the first time in your life, you have a little and you're gonna hide it away and you're gonna make sure nobody takes it from you. Or maybe you get really focused on trying to increase it and build that wealth and have those things and have that security and you really want that and you start getting suspicious of people around you because you wonder if someone wants to take what you finally have. Be careful of the gods of this world, the lowercase g, gods of this world that we quickly serve that are things God often provides for us, but we can forget that we serve the God of provision, not the, God, not the blessing or provision he gives. We serve God. We serve God. We love God regardless of the blessings. But when the blessings come, don't lose your focus. Don't lose your focus. God loves you. 
God loves you. And in this Advent season, I know as a dad, I'm really excited to give gifts to my kids, to my wife. I, I love that. I love gift giving. I think it's a lot of fun. And I literally just bought my daughter a gift just yesterday, and I cannot wait for her to see it. Right now, she's like, what? You did? Which one is it, right? Under the tree? But I know the gift I gave her, and I saw it, and I knew it was for her. I knew kind of what it would mean to her. I love that. And I think God has that for us too. He enjoys blessing us. He enjoys being a good and kind father. It, it delights him. And that is wonderful. But he met our deepest want and desire in Jesus. One of the names of Jesus, the title of Jesus, is the desire of nations right? He's actually what we most deeply long for. And we need to hold on to that truth and remember that God gave us first, foremost, and really um, everything else is just kind of extras. Jesus is it. That is the greatest gift. But God also knows that in our life there are desires and wants. And he frequently gives and blesses us with other things in relationships, um, in, in actual physical gifts or different things. He blesses us because he's a good father. And he knows that it brings joy to our life. It delights him to do that. But oftentimes when he gives, I think it's, it's blown my mind how many times God has done something kind for me in the words of someone in a letter written to me. Um, even, even in some of the things where, where I've had to be confronted and it hurt at first, but I realized it was the love of God keeping me from going a certain direction. Oftentimes his gifts are the very thing that our heart has longed for, just like Elizabeth. There's something our heart has longed for that there's not even words to express anymore. It's a groaning that comes from deep within us. Don't let the fulfillment of that groaning supplant the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart. It's very easy to do when you get the thing you wanted. And I want to caution us as a church. I, I mean, I say this to myself as much as I do to you. It's so easy to supplant him and put that on the throne. But that's not what we do. It's not what we do. We actually, like Elizabeth, we let the, the blessing draw us closer to him. Draw us closer to him. It's a beautiful rhythm in our faith. Since we are filled with the Holy Spirit and every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, here's what we know. We recognize something of him in the way he blesses us and cares for us and meets those needs and speaks into our life. When we're filled with the Spirit, what happens is we begin to recognize the gift that comes into our life. Just like Elizabeth recognized Jesus Christ, who she couldn't have known, just couldn't have known him. In the, I'm not going to go into all that. I just know this. There's no way she could have known who the Messiah was and the greatness of his identity and the wonder of his throne. She couldn't have known. But when he walked in, she knew he was there. She, she recognized him in spirit. I just love that. I super love that. When the gift comes into our life and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the gift comes from the Father. We recognize the source. And the next thing we get to do is worship God in it. That child met a long, deep-held need in her life, but it didn't live on the throne of her life. It fulfilled a desire for her and Zachariah but I am so glad that they were righteous. Remember, they were righteous before the gift. I'm so glad that they saw something bigger than their desire being met. They saw the desire of nations. They saw that God was doing something. And wonder of wonders that they began to fixate on him. And I think, you know, even for them, can you imagine the conversations? Could this be the Messiah? Can you imagine? I mean, it's one-sided right now because Zechariah is mute. But um, <laughs> it's probably not funny. I shouldn't joke about it. But um, think about it. Can you imagine her saying, like, after Mary's been there, do you, Messiah and the one preparing the way. Oh, my word. Can you imagine the dots they're connecting, the joy they're, they're experiencing? Because they didn't fixate on the blessing. They started living in God's bigger vision. Oh, man, super good. So we may have something we desperately want or need. We, we know our hearts and our minds and our eyes may be fixed on it. But what we need to do is fix our eyes on Christ Jesus because again, when we're filled with his spirit and our heart is fixated on him when his blessings come, they come 
in a way that our spirit will recognize him. Our gaze, oh, we have to fight from our gaze being shifted away from that which matters most. We have to guard against that. We can celebrate. We can celebrate the good things. But let us never fail to celebrate that in the most wonderful, grace-filled way possible, God has folded you and I into his plan the way he did Elizabeth. He's brought us in. And where does he bring us into it? He usually brings us from the thing where we've hurt the most, and he's going to do what we talked about, beauty from ashes. Something beautiful was coming out of her ashes. We can celebrate one thing, that it isn't about us, that it remains about the one thing that has always been our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can celebrate that the gifts we're given have little to do with us and so much to do with the glory of Jesus Christ being literally pouring out of us into this world and transforming the world we're in. We are part of a bigger story. If we only would get our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes fixated on the one who rules in our hearts, who lives in our hearts, who saved us from our sin. We can celebrate that it isn't about us. We celebrate this Christmas because it's always been and will always be about him. Pray with me, church. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your word. Thank you for providing it and uh, speaking through it. I pray, God, that as we go... um, into the week to come, that we would look for the ways that, yes, you have blessed us, but we would also look for the ways that your spirit is calling out to us and speaking through us the way it did in Elizabeth, speaking through us and blessing the world around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we live in the age of fulfillment of all these promises, that we look at this as history, but we're part of that history. We live in the promised age of the Holy Spirit, filling us, working through us for the glory of one, the one whom we love, the one whom we confess, the one to whom all praise and worship is given, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Come, Emmanuel, in ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appear. Rejoice. Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou wisdom from on high. The path of knowledge show Teach us in her ways to go Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel Shall come Again I say rejoice For unto us is born The Savior of the world And take heart Oh weary soul Take heart For help is on its way And holy is His name Rejoice again Say rejoice, for unto us is born the Savior of the world. And take heart, O weary soul, take heart, for help is on its way. And holy is His name. Rejoice, rejoice.
Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, I can't say rejoice, for unto us is born the Savior of the world. And take heart, O weary soul, take heart, for help is on its way. As you prepare to uh, go back into life, wherever you're worshiping from right now, I invite you to take a moment and do a heart check. What's sitting on the throne of your heart? And make sure, make sure that the good things God has given you haven't tried to supplant the place only he can have, the, the throne of your heart. He is our Lord and he is our Savior. And we need to make sure that we keep him in that role of Lord, that we don't let his blessings become our gods and guard yourself against it. But do enjoy the goodness of God in this season as you do. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, grace and peace to you as you go throughout this week.